Few animation artists serve as top kicks in both television cartoons and theatrical animation, but veteran producer and art director Ed Gertner has done just that. After graduating from CalArts, Ed commenced working at the House of Mouse, where he worked as a layout artist on The Great Mouse Detective before jumping to television and the well-known cat Garfield. The pattern was set, and from the mid-1980s on, Ed hopped nimbly from television to big screen productions, more often than not, in lead positions. Ed was an art director, producer, and director on the television incarnations of Winnie the Pooh, Tailspin, and The Little Mermaid. He leaped back into features as a layout supervisor on Beauty and the Beast, following that assignment up with work on The Lion King and Tom and Jerry the Movie. More recently, he has focused on work with the primetime half hours The Simpsons and Bob's Burgers. We spoke in the conference room of the Animation Guild. We're talking today with Ed Gertner on November 24, 2011, about his long and illustrious career at Disney and other places, many other places. So, uh, to start with, you, Ed, you started... Um, I mean, you a, 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 grew up in the San Fernando Valley, correct? Correct, yeah. I grew up in the northern end of the valley and uh, lived here all my life and um, went through L.A. City school systems. I can add. I can count. <laughs> That's right. And the school systems in the, in the valley were actually uh, a pretty darn good back in the day. Yeah, they were. I mean, I had some really good teachers. Uh, and I know some people will laugh because in uh, my high school, I had an architecture teacher who was a real architect, so I learned from somebody who actually did it, not somebody who had gone to school and got their degree. Yeah. Um, and what had happened was I was always interested in animation. My grandfather worked at uh, Disney as a oh, really? transportation. He was the head of transportation. Really? I and, didn't know that. How long was he there? Uh, from 50... Early 50s through 80, just about 80. So he sure. retired out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in those days, everybody stayed at Disney for 50 years. Well, the, the funny thing was uh, he told me a story. He did a few things. He uh, he actually rode the motorcycle for Blackbeard's Ghost. Oh, really? That they took With Peter out. Houston off. Yeah. And, um, but what was, what was great was that he was in the Army Reserve. Yeah. And on certain weekends... Ron Miller was in that too. He was. Oh, his, really? He was his <laughs> boss on the weekends, and he was during Miller, the week. Miller was his boss. Yeah. So they'd come by and salute him, you know, on the way. But uh, uh, what happened was, I had talked to my grandfather, and I said, "Do you know anybody in the animation department? You know, can I come in and, and interview and just see what's going on?" And he said, "Well, yeah, here's a number." So I went in and I saw Ed Hansen came in and uh, I had a little portfolio. I was in 10th grade at the time and I uh, the Olympics had been on so I was life drawing from the Olympics. Oh my god. And um, when I got in he said oh yeah let me introduce you to somebody and he opens his door next door and it's Eric Larson. And I sat with Eric for about two hours. He was going over my drawings. I knew who Eric was. I mean, oh, God, it's Eric Larson. You know, yeah, that's oh, amazing. My God. And he's doing that for a 10th grader. Yeah. And, I mean, he, he he gave himself freely. I mean, he was he was the greatest guy. And oh, I yeah. sat in there, and I thought, my drawings, you know, they were terrible. And he said, oh, no, those, these are pretty good. And he started drawing over them. Yeah. And he goes, oh, this is a good one, and that's a good one. And he goes, you know, you, you, you'd be pretty good for Cal Arts. We're starting a program up there. And they had just started it in those days. Yeah, actually, it hadn't yet. But what was funny about it was I'm sitting there and Jack Hanna walks through, and he was the, the head of the department up there, and he goes, uh, Jack, it was Ed, and introduced me at that time. Yeah. And uh, so I finished uh, my high school, yeah. and then I, I put my portfolio together and sent it up to Cal Arts. And uh, I had talked to Jack and everybody at, at the studio, and... He said, oh, yeah, you'll be good for the program. You'll be good for the program. So I said, great. You know, no problem. And I got a letter back saying that I wasn't accepted. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've interviewed and two was, other people that had I that was experience. Like, well, 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 what happened? You know, and I thought, there goes my life. I'm going to be, you know. What am I going to do? Walking the streets, you know. 
because this is what I really wanted to do. I took a bunch of art classes and I was having a great time and um, I took life drawing from, um, boy, I'm trying to remember his name now. He was the political uh, cartoonist for the Bill Valley, News, Valley News and Green Show. Oh, okay. Not, I've seen the LA Times. Um, and he was a he was a good guy, and I learned a lot from him. And you know, obviously going to Cal Arts, uh, but uh, <laughs> so I called up Jack and I said, uh, "I was supposed to come up, but he goes, oh, you got the wrong letter too." <laughs> what they had made a clerical error? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because what we have you set, we you have a, a they, I, I I was lucky. I'll knock on wood here. Um, the studio paid for most of my education. Um, oh, really? I got half scholarship. Did your grandfather have some influence there, or was it just uh, something else? No, I think it was. I think Jack and and the ha, had some say on that. Oh, okay. And I guess he saw something in me. I, you know, uh, so it was that was a good thing because I really only had to put up money for I think one quarter of a semester or something like that. Wow. And um, so I, I got lucky. Um, but I was up there. I, I got in, and I was up there for four years. Got my Bachelor of Art. Got your entire degree, which a lot yes. of people at that time didn't. They, no. like, cut out on the second or third year. Yeah, and I was in the second year of the program. The first year had uh, Henry Selleck and John Lesser and Brad Bird, and all those guys were up there. And in my class was uh, Mike Giamo, uh, Tim Burton, Mike Peraza, uh, Phil Niblink, Chris Buck, and um, all guys that have had big careers yeah. in the business. And we had the greatest teachers. You know, we had you know Bill Moore, who scared the hell out of us the first year, but then when we understood what he was doing to us, <laughs> teaching us in a, a very heavy-handed way, it was great. And I've never forgotten anything he taught me. He really? Was, he was a really good design teacher. Hmm. Um, strange, but it was it was good. <laughs> um, and uh, Ken O'Connor was the one who actually. He had a huge influence over a lot of people. He he was a quiet man, but he was powerful. And I was when I came into Cal Arts, uh, I was. 18, just barely 18, yeah. and a lot of the guys had already gone to school or, you know, they were about ten, five to ten years older than, the, than I was. Yeah, because, like, I know John Musker was, had graduated yeah. from school back east and, or yeah. Midwest and was already... Uh, yeah, so it was, it, maybe I, I was green. I mean, I was really green, and uh, everybody, it, was, it was a pleasant time. Yeah. Uh, the first year, the second year, getting into it, but then... They started hiring, and yeah. the politics came in, and there was, you know, a little, it's just the natural, you know, everybody wants the job, and so there was a little bit of, you know, politics going on up there. Plus, what was really difficult is that during the show, um, the artists and management from Disney and other studios would come up. Yeah. And... At the time, Bluth was just about ready to leave, and they all knew it. And, right. And I so think he jumped off in '79. We kind of stood in the middle of the room. So if, if we talked to Don, would we get hired at Disney? So I didn't want to talk to them. But if we talked to Disney, would we get hired for Don? <laughs> was Don already? Yeah, he left. He had had. His, I know. And by '80, he had his yeah. own studio. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it was like. Uh, who, who do we talk to? But um, <clears throat> there were strange situations that went on. But uh, it was such a great time. Um, uh, Groucho Marx would show up, you know, at the at the school because he 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 was one of the donor donators of money to the school. And uh, <laughs> and you, Tuesday nights in the Bijou or Friday excuse me Friday nights in the Bijou, and. Uh, it was just an interesting time because a lot of the guys had who had given money came up and actually performed and show uh, in music or theater or um, even you know in animation. Um, and my history was uh, I'm named after my uncle who right. worked at Disney way back in the 30s, and 
during 19, well, during the strike, he left and was one of the owners with Basusto and all the rest oh, of it. Oh, UPA? Oh, my God. And what he did was that he, they were going to open up UPA East. Yeah. And so they sent him back to New York to find a place. And at the time, it was the, the Hayes Commission was getting going in. Uh, uh, God, now I'm forgetting his name. Um, Who's the congressman that everybody hates? Uh, oh, you're talking the, about the, the House of American the com- Activity. The, yeah, the committee. Co- communism. Yeah, yeah, the HUAC committee. Yeah. And Par- Parnell? What happened was uh, he got back there, and David Hoberman was a communist. Right. And he owned Academy Pictures. And what happened was my uncle said, I'll buy it from you. Because if the government ever caught up with him, it would have been it for the business. Right. So my uncle bought it from him and uh, had Bill Tytla and, and uh, Art Babbitt working with him. Yeah. And they did some commercials, but it didn't last long. He he early, I think it was 54 or 55, he was walking down 42nd Avenue and had a heart attack. And that was it? And that was it. And that's too bad. And he's your know, uncle. Yeah, but I didn't know this until... Gosh. Years and years, years later. later. So you're really a third generation yep. guy. Yeah. Your grandfather, your uncle, anybody yep. else in the business? No, that was that was it. Um my mom was an actress as a kid, but that was um way back when. Yeah. She'll hate me for saying yeah, yeah. that, but that's well, okay. <laughs> back Yeah. Back when she was a kid. Days. But um so at CalArts, Ken O'Connor uh really I want to say befriended me and was showing me all the stuff that layout was. And I was in the animation class and struggling a little bit. I could animate, but the guys already had to jump on me because, uh, back to the story, I was, you know, about 10 years, five to 10 years behind people. You were younger. Yeah. And um, I loved animating, but then I saw that I could create these worlds and I could be. You know, I could design the houses, and I could design the characters, and I could, you know, it's like, wow. And I don't have to draw the same character over and over and over. Right, making it move. Yeah, and run camera. I loved camera. So uh, I, I kind of drifted towards uh, layout. Yeah. And uh, it became a lot of fun for me because it was, like I said, I could create my own worlds. Sure. Um, along with that uh, at CalArts, Jules Engel was the instructor for the, uh, uh, what was that called? Uh, oh, my God. Now I'm getting old. Uh, the <laughs> the uh, design program the, background? The animation, it was uh, the animation department that was there. It was uh, in, not inspirational. Boy. Um, oh, that's all right. Doesn't whatever. Matter. Uh but Jules Engel. But Jules knew my uncle, and so I knew Jules, and I would cross. I would go down and see what they were doing down there. Experimental animation, thank you. I, can't, I knew it would come to me. Um, and that's where I met a few people like uh, Mark Kirkland, who were yeah. in that program. And so we would cross. Because uh, uh, Mark started out in the way mm-hmm. out as well, before ending up a director on yeah. 400 episodes of the show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it was great uh, to be able to, I, I think right from the start, I didn't want to get locked into one thing. Yeah. And so uh, as the time went on, the third, my third year, I did my picture, and I actually got called from the studio to, to come work on Fox and the Hound. And I figured I had spent three years already, and they've already, you know, they paid for my schooling, that I should spend one more year and just fine-tune it a little bit and get, get my degree. degree. Yeah, absolutely. And they agreed, so I stayed there another year. And when I came out, I went right into the studio and worked on Fox and the Hound. It was, it was a, still it was, going. It was still going. But that's not the... The, uh, the interesting thing was uh, the Black Cauldron. Yeah. Because they had brought up some of the artwork. Ken Anderson, I think it was, who brought it up. Uh, my freshman year, I think, we saw some of the development work. I went through college... I got in, worked on Fox and the Hound. Yeah. I worked on 
some Epcot and Tokyo Disneyland projects for another year. And then I worked on the Black Cauldron. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> Jim Coleman, the background artist, did all those sort of color studies with the bottom lighting yeah. and the, this lighting and the waterfalls, which ended up sort of influencing his later work in uh, his own galleries, yeah. Hawaiian studies. Yeah. But he did a lot of studies on the Black Cauldron. And, you know, I don't think any of that stuff really found its way into the film. No, the film... Unfortunately, uh, it's not a bad film. I, I, I saw it years later. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, there was a lot of artwork that didn't make it in the film. It kind of got muddied up because people, they, Art Stevens was a director at one time and he left, and then Ted Berman and Rick Rich switched um, sequences. Rick Rich was heavily involved in it, and Stevens left. Mm -hmm. and uh, Joe Hale yeah, he was, producer. was producing. Right. So you had a lot of guys. I mean, Hale had done a lot of layout, yeah. and there were some interesting environmental stuff in it. But and, yeah, and when I first got in, uh, in 1980, uh, Frank and Ollie were still there, and Wooly was right next door to me, and uh, Milk Call had come in. And so it was great having at least a little bit of time to see how these guys actually work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, so what happened was I came in and worked on Fox and the Hound. And, uh, now, were you in layouts? I was that? in layout. I was assistant layout in there. And uh, I got to actually work on the last multiplane shot that we wow. did on the camera for, for the, one of the features. Now, what was that? That was the end shot where we pull back or you see the uh, tableau of the fox and the hound up on the hill in the sunset. Yeah. And so they said, okay, you can do this, but, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money, and, you know, so you've got five levels to work with. I said, okay, great. So I ran a test, and it, it was okay. There were some problems with it. And then it was, <clears throat> well, now you've got maybe three levels that you can <clears throat> that you can use. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I can I see it coming, you know, i got to so make sure. So you cut it from five to three, and yeah. what, you end up with two? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sort of uh, takes away a lot of the dynamism of uh, Yeah. But of that was a great experience, because having to mathematically figure out each layer, and, and at the time, we didn't have Xerox machines at the studio, so we had to do oh, it. Oh, yeah, because it was all, it was still all a hand. Yeah. It was just like they had done it during Pinocchio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and of course, then later when digital came in, you could do as multiplying. Who needs that? We'll just do multiple <laughs> levels in the computer. Right. Uh, and an example of that. This was 1980. Uh, one day, and I, I loved to scour the studio. I'd always walk around and find things under uh, down in the basement, and and I walked down one day and I hear all these voices. And I'm like, What's going on down here? And in the hallway, which was in a room that was maybe five maybe five feet by 40 feet long yeah for all the uh the operators for the studio with their with oh, yeah. their wires plugging it in <laughs> yeah, that's all gone now too. Was, i felt like it was in the time machine and room. that was an old switchboard yeah it was amazing it wasn't just after that though we got our xerox machines and they got the phones redone <laughs> but uh how the past it just kind of stayed at the studio at Disney. Yeah. So what happened after uh, Fox and the Hound and your two-level multiplane yeah. shot? But it worked. But like some of the other shots in that movie, I you know the the cost of the movie kept growing and um, and they they just wanted it done. So we finished it. It looks okay, uh, but it's kind of like the uh, non-moving waterfall that's still in the movie. Uh, they yeah. just didn't have money to. They didn't want to spend the time or money to uh, put the... Yeah, and that was the highest grossing animated film in its time. time. Yeah. It's like it made more yeah. than The Rescuers, which had done really well. So um, so then I went on to a little bit of The Cauldron. I was on there for uh, for a very short time. But the Epcot and Tokyo Disneyland project was yeah. really interesting because I got to work with, at the time, WED. <clears throat> it was called, not WDI. And... Uh, we, we set up a little group, and uh, Dave Michener was directing that group, and uh, he made me an art director, which was great. You know, I was I was only 
what, 21, 22, something like that. And you're already art directing. Yeah. And those were, those were the animated uh, interstitials that went into the, yeah. into the rides yeah. and into the pre-shows. The Figment, the Dragon, and the Kodak oh, yeah. Pavilion, and uh, a few of the pavilions. But the, what I was so green when I came in, I just, I was like, you know, eyes wide open. Oh, yeah, sure, I'll do whatever. And, and they said, okay, well, we're going to do these interstitials, and we have some artists over at WDI that we want you to work with. And I said, oh, okay, great, no problem. And those and artists? I, and I walked into the room the day they said, well, we go over there and give them their, their assignments. And I opened the door. There's Ken O'Connor and Claude Coates and Mark Davis, and Ken Anderson was there, and, <laughs> and I said, ah. Uh, oh, all of them, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have to do this? And my mentor, Ken, who was great, he said, oh, now the student is the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, thanks a lot. And you're giving them the assignments. I'm giving them the assignments. <laughs> uh, That's and it was, <laughs> Yeah. It, That's pretty funny. It was great, and they were great. You know, there wasn't... Uh, a problem uh, I, I definitely had to because of the communication back and forth there's some things that changed but other than that you know these guys were extreme pros and they did their oh, job yeah. and it was great um, but we had one instance where we were working on the transportation pavilion and we had bicycles we had a hundred bicycles moving at different speeds yeah and they were asking me, they said, well, how, it's strobing, what, what do we do? And I said, you've got a hundred different strips of, of film. And it was this was optical printing time, this wasn't right. even computer time. Oh, sure, this was back when it was all analog. And we're sitting there, and I said, well, you know, people are going to be in cars going past this stuff, so there's no way you're ever going to get it to not strobe, because depending upon somebody turns their head or... You know, the car's moving past the stuff right. that's still. You'd have to shoot it at 50 frames a second. Yeah, and um, and so, so I, it's not that they didn't believe me, but they didn't believe me. And <laughs> so they said, well, let's get Ward Kimball over here. He, he He's dealt with this before. And yeah, so, Kimball came in and he worked on yeah. the GM Pavilion for yeah. quite a while. And so we were in Sound Stage 2, which was empty except for a big 70 millimeter 70 millimeter screen at one end and all of us standing there and so somebody got on the phone hey Ward why don't you come over we want to show you something okay great so you know 15 20 minutes later the door opens up and the light spills across this dark sound stage and this little guy with big glasses comes waddling up and he says hey guys and we're standing here say okay Roll what it. do you think <laughs> so the film rolls and he goes it strobes, and he turns and walks out. <laughs> Thanks for telling us what we already know. Ward Kimball at his best. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, what are you going to do? But uh, you Move on. Yeah, we moved on, do. and we did it, and we moved on. Um, and then I got on to um, the great mouse of uh, Basil of Baker Street. Right, Basil of Baker calls. Street, its original and best title, and then it changed to the great mouse detective. The great detective. mouse detective, blah, 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 and have a seven-year-old say that. But um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I was co-art director for a bit with Mike Peraza on that, and we had a we had a great time. Good movie. Yeah, and I think still it's one of the more fun pictures that's come out of the recent years. Yeah, you know, just for a cartoon character, uh, well, it's got statement. a lightness to it. It's yeah. more, and I had a great pl uh, time lighthearted on that because they had, um, and now I'm forgetting his name. It's terrible. You had a the person. music, the music, uh, Henry Mancini. Henry Mancini. I did a sequence that was cut out, and he and I sat and worked. It was called Misty Morning. Oh, okay. And uh, after the battle. In the toy shop, our characters were going to walk back through London to go back to Baker Street. And so I had done all these uh, pastels because I'd worked with Mel Shaw for a little bit and learned how, how to do the pastel work on it. And uh, he wrote some beautiful music for it. And so we had it as a color, kind of a little animatic. Yeah. yeah. But it took away from the picture. It was too long. 
and so they, it got cut. Yeah, well, I had to cut to length. Yeah, and yeah. And pacing and all that good stuff. But it was so great working with someone like Mancini because he just he was so excited about uh, the picture and animation. He was like a little kid. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, there was still some cauldron going on and and some other stuff, and they had Mobius upstairs too. Yeah. And at the time, it was like, wow, God, Mobius is here, and and uh, you could never he could never leave his door open because people would go through the trash pulling out all his uh, his drawings that he would throw out. <laughs> yeah. His room was always clean. It was amazing. So you take his rejects and put them in a folder. Yeah. And Always a good eBay. thing to do. Yes. Um, so after that, I uh, I was working on the Mouse Detective, and that was about the time that they moved us off the main lot. Everybody was kicked out of the animation building and moved over to Glendale. Yeah. And uh, it just became very. It was it was tough to work. It disturbed. It was very industrial. Yeah. And it wasn't laid out like a no. animation studio. And the anymore. building wasn't even finished when we moved in. It was. Uh, it was still half a building, and um, there were some things that went on that I didn't ap appreciate, so I quit, which was extremely hard for me to do because that was the place I wanted to work at. Now you did you quit at the end of the Great no, House Detective? It was in the middle. In the middle. Um, I, as I said before, I was co-art director, and um, somebody else was brought into art director, and we weren't told about it. And so I decided, well, if I sit here, it there, you know, it, I felt like I was being taken advantage of. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't want to sit there and, and have my whole career be that way after that. So I did, made the decision to leave. And what I did is I, when I left, I went to uh, Film Roman. And Phil, had, Phil Roman had just started his studio. Film Roman. Yeah. F-I-L-M. Film Roman. And they were and over in Toluca Lake on yeah, Riverside Drive. Right across time. from Patty's. And what was great about that was it was just like a, it, it reminded me of going back to college again. And it was just, you know, we got to get the stuff done. He had Garfield and uh, he brought, uh, he meaning Phil Roman, brought in some of Herb Spence and all these guys from you know, MGM and uh, DePatty Freeling and Mike Law would stop by. Oh, and, yeah. So I got to talk to these guys and see how the other half lived. <laughs> so the, the non-Disney contingent of the animation industry. I have one question related to that, and that is, did you line up your escape to film Roman before quitting, yes. or did you quit yeah. and yeah, then look no, around for work? I was stupid, but not that stupid. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I did look for work first uh, before I, I made the jump. And lucky enough, I, I picked up that job, and I was... I don't want to say art directing, uh, uh, designing, because, you know... Um, um, you do some of everything. Aren't yeah. Us? So I, I did some I did some painting. I did some uh, backgrounds. I did some, uh, mostly the layout design uh, for uh, the Halloween special. And you worked for Phil for... Uh... I worked there for a year, and then I left and came back to Disney TV. Oh, okay. So you started left... It. You left film rolling and went back to Disney TV, yeah. and then you ended up having quite a run yeah. at Disney TV. Yeah. You were producing, you yeah. were art directing, you were yeah. doing all kinds of stuff. What was, was that like? It was a time, because they had just gotten started, and Michael Webster was in charge of uh, TV animation at the time, and had a small group of people, quite a few from features, mm -hmm. and uh, we were doing DuckTales. Uh, when I came in, they were doing DuckTales. They had just done Gummy Bears. Right. That was their first. Yeah. And, and DuckTales was the one that really put them on the map, yeah. and DuckTales was the one that they were over budget to begin with, and the yeah. studio was yeah, ticked off. Furious. Was that tense being furious. there? Yeah, and what was interesting, I was back working with uh, Mike Perez again, and uh, he had one show and I would take the next show. And what was happening is coming out of uh, features where – you did a layout design, and you got it till you you did it till you got it right. Yeah. Uh, to TV, where we had thirty designs to do in one week. So you and you, it was you hit the ground running. You slam right along. Yeah. But it was great because it 
it taught me how to put something down on paper the first time and get it through. Look at the design, make sure you like it, and get it out. Right. So that you're was, able to hit the 30, 30 a week mark? Yeah, we did that for a, a while, and then we had to have a meeting with the writers and say, can you can you back off just a little Not bit? Not so many locations. <laughs> uh, but that's what the stories were. You know, Carl Barks, you know, they'd go from here to there with right. uh, Scrooge. And so um, that was great. And when that was done, uh, they, were st they started Winnie the Pooh. And uh, I was called to... Uh, art direct that and so what I did is I checked into the the shorts that had been done at the studio yeah and tried to follow what they had done but expand on that um, that thought and uh, so and that was a very popular and it show. was really it, it did well and uh, Carl Gears was the producer the first year and yeah I loved working with Carl he's a really good story guy and an artist uh, he didn't want to produce the second year and so I took the reins from him, uh, and I had a partner. I handled a lot of the artwork, and my partner uh, did uh, some of the story. We, When the stories came in, we looked at the stories together and gave our points of view, and then we would split. And then he would handle more of the business end of it, and I would handle the storyboards and the and the artwork. And TV animation was relatively small at that period It was really time. small. We had... 20 people, 30 people. And something. you were spread out. I think you were down in the Coenga building, yes. and you were... Yeah. And then later it got huge, yeah. but in those no, early days... No, we only had the two shows. And then uh, it, it grew, uh, and what happened was the, the my first year, I think it was the first... Well, it was Winnie the Pooh. Uh, I was lucky enough they sent me down to Australia to yeah. help start the uh, studio down there, yeah. which was Hanna-Barbera. And they bought it from Hanna Barbera yeah. and then uh, started. It, yeah. it really became a going yeah. operation. And they were they were great artists down there. And so when I got down there, it was a breeze to figure out who was who could stay and who could go. Yeah. Um, because they were all pretty much really good. Yeah. Um, uh, but we could we could. They had the ability to do camera and ink and paint, but they didn't want to use that. So that was the only people that we really didn't hire. Back. Really. Uh, but the rest of the artists we we had hired from H and B, and uh, we did the uh, Winnie the Pooh series there. You did all the episodes down there? Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them. A lot of them, for the majority. Yeah, and that and that show lasted what four seasons? Yes, I think it was four. Yes, yeah, four. And, and uh, you did I, how many? About sixty-five episodes. Um, boy, now I'm trying to remember. Oh, probably something like because that. Because I got off at the fourth season. I didn't I wasn't on the last year. I was producing uh Tailspin. I was one of the line producers. And uh I won an Emmy for the Winnie the Pooh series because I mean it just we had tied I think we tied with uh Beetlejuice or something like yeah. that oh, at yeah. the time. Um but it was such a a pleasure to work on the Winnie the Pooh series. It was simple and we had a lot of great artists working on it and uh after that, like I said I, I produced the uh, Tailspin series. I did uh, 13 episodes. Mm -hmm. And when that was done, I got a call from Disney Features to come over. They wanted me to be layout supervisor on Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Now, how did you make the transition back after? Oh, of course, you've been sort of the supervisor on Great Mouse. But yeah. then you swing over to... TV animation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a whole different style of working, Yeah. and now you're suddenly back. What made them say, let's get Ed to uh, do Beauty and the Beast, uh, since you've been away from it? Yeah. A good friend, uh, Brian McEntee, was the uh, art director. Right. And I'd been in touch, I'd stayed in touch with him on and off, and Don Hahn and, and the group, and... Um, uh, luckily enough, they called me. You know, they knew I was around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I said, yeah, wait, wait let me think. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll work on this. <laughs> yeah. So uh, So uh, what were the challenges that that, that, that picture presented? That was a, a big challenge because it was kind of funny. We were back on the lot. They had us in the ink and paint building. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey... 
they had they had started the movie and had sent it to the Purdoms in England, and they had spent a year in England setting up the movie, and it became this very stiff. It was beautiful, but it was very European and very highly detailed, and it just didn't have the charm that I think that they were looking for. Yeah, yeah. So they pulled it back, and they brought in Kirk Weiss and Gary Trousdale to direct it and said, you know, you guys have three months. Put it together or we're going to shut the place down. The whole studio? The whole, or just the whole studio, we're, because it's going nowhere and we're right. spending money. So we spent the three months and, and just worked our butts off. Yeah. It, but we had a good time. It was really yeah, you were fun. you were art direct you were you were designing and stuff. Yeah, I was like designing, that. yeah. You weren't I were was you working. involved in the story process at all? The storyboards uh, and all we that? We were asked you know, I mean we, there were meetings and we would we could throw our ideas out. But uh no, it, we were working so fast that it was what do we do, what do we do? And Brian McEntee was was great at handling the art between, you know, um, uh, I think Tanya Wilson also did had, had done some work on there, too. She was on it. And so as far as designing uh, areas, locales, and, um, uh, and and he was very involved with the story. Uh, Brian was you know, yeah, going yeah. back and forth. Um, so it was like it was very cohesive, and it worked really well. And when time came to, to run the picture for Jeffrey, he loved it. So yeah, and, and you had the uh, you had the composer songwriter on there at yeah. that point, right? Yeah, so yeah Howard were, was uh, How, uh, Howard was amazing guy. I mean, he his music and he just he thought story. That's all it was. Right. And uh, well, and he had a big input on story yeah. too, right? Yes. And uh, so it was like, go, let's go. So I was layout supervisor, and I had a small crew, uh, 10, 12 people, I think. I can't remember now the exact number. And we just batted it out. Uh, and at the time, they were just getting started with uh, caps. They had this; it was the first picture totally done on caps, uh, yeah, which yeah. was the Disney proprietary uh, animation system, computer system. And um, uh, we were getting into the, the the CG world too. And you were getting it was you were getting more flexible, and you do this. Designing the yeah. ballroom and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, so we had we had we picked our spots uh, to to send to the CG department, and one was a ballroom, and the other one was, believe it or not, the Wolf Chase. At yeah. The end. But the computers were weren't quite there yet to to do trees and have pans and camera moves. It just the time frame just wasn't long enough. Yeah. But the ballroom we we did, and. Uh, we all had a hand in it. Larry Leaker was the layout uh, person who got the workbook and, and the storyboard. You know, we worked yeah. together. And um, um, from start to finish was pretty much like one year. We wow. had we from zero to, to done in layout. <laughs> Going at 100 miles an yeah. hour. Yeah, yeah. But what was so great about it, it was like, first shot out, what do you think? Great, good, let's go. And So you think your TV training really helped in this regard? Yeah. Because, you yeah. know. Yeah, we had to get it done. You know, what's what do we need to do? Let's sit and be clear about it. But also, Ken O'Connor, it was very instrumental uh, in part of that, too, I think, when he was teaching Now, what us. advice was he giving you? Or did he did he give me any advice during the picture, or was it just his influence from before? His influence from before, uh, but I would talk to him a little bit, and it was you, you make sure you know what you're doing before you put anything on paper, basically. You know, right. Don't waste your time piddling Exploring. around. Exploring. Yeah, I mean that's you know uh, you want to go do that, do that on your own, but the, it's a, it's still a business, and you right. have to get it done. Right. And uh, it was. Uh, just that notion stuck in the back of my head. Yeah. You know, like, like we got to do it. Okay. Yeah. What's the best way to do it? We got to do it this way. And everybody was in line with that. And it turned out. Well, obviously, it turned out great. Um, you know, spending one year on it and then having it be nominated for best picture, which was amazing. You I know, can imagine. Uh, after that, 
I thought I'd be on for a while, uh, but I had to go back to TV because I had a contract with TV. So I finished up my contract. Uh, I went back to TV animation and art directed the Little Mermaid series the first season. Mm-hmm. And we had a, I had a great time on that too. But at that time, TV was getting large, larger, and uh, Gary Kreisel had come in, being uh, uh, the president of TV. And it just felt like big, a big monster. Bigger and more unwieldy. Yeah, and, and at the time, that's when uh, consumer products started getting in the picture, too, because we were working with uh, uh, Ariel, and I was setting up shots uh, in shows, and I wanted to stay as true to the picture as possible. Yeah. Because that's what people want. I mean, they're not, they don't want something new. They, you, if you're doing Mermaid... Then do you're doing the you're doing you're basing it off of the feature. Sure, and all the people that had all the artists that had done the great work uh, for the movie, you know. So I'm going to use what they have and and, and add to it with the stories that we absolutely. Had. Um, but then we started getting notes like, well, she has to have a purple phone in her room. <laughs> Excuse me. From a seashell. Yeah, yeah, uh, and then it was oh she needs this to wear and she, it has to be pink. I thought, oh, you know, sort of intruding on your turf. Yeah, I, you know, I get it. It's business, but you know, it's still entertainment. We still have to make the product and let the product run. You know, let let our movie or our shows run the product that they make, not the other way around. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so after that was done, I. I really wanted to get back to features. I love doing features. I like doing TV, too. There's nothing wrong with that. But I like to focus on one... Uh, one big one project. One big project, rather than doing, you know, 5 or 10 or 20 or, you know, 50, 65. Because your mind sort of on the next episode when you're still working on yeah. the present episode, Yeah, and right? I want to do more, but I can't because I have to get on to the next episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's TV. Yeah, it's a good thing. So you swung back into features. So I went back to features on The Lion King. Good one to go back yeah. on. Yes. And at the time, uh, the directors were being changed. George, George Scribner was, was uh, working on something else. They took him off and brought in Rob and uh, Rob Minkoff, Minkoff and, uh, with uh, Roger Allers. Oh, Roger Allers. And um, I was had... The great pleasure of working uh, with Tom Enriquez uh, had been boarding, and so I got his sequel. Uh, I got the uh, wildebeest uh, chase. Oh, that's a hell and of I a got sequence! To, uh, and I got to workbook it, and work with the uh, <clears throat> excuse me scene planning and all the computers, and and um, uh, I was on that for a couple of years actually. I had really? a few sequences, but that was the big sequence, and. Uh, I know my kids said, well, what did you do on, on, the, on the Lion King? And I said, well, I killed, well, I had a great I killed Mufasa. There was Tom Enriquez and <laughs> Andy Gaskell. Yeah. And yeah, well, eventually the whole studio got on there. It was at the time when they were trying to split the uh, productions up. So Pocahontas and uh, Lion King were going on at the same time. And both were having a little bit of trouble. So Jeffrey or whoever said, you know, let's let's... Let's get one working, and then we can roll on to the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I did some, I had a lot of fun on, I keep saying that, I had a lot of fun on on, um, on Lion King because, like I said, the computers were just, they were getting really pretty good. Finally catching up. Yeah. And so we used uh, CG Wildebeest. Yeah. But uh, on the move that we did, uh to see the wildebeest on the top of the hill, we still were playing around with uh, backgrounds as far as CG goes, and so I, we worked at as a 2D uh, element with 3D objects on it. Yeah. And we we just collapsed the top part of the ground. When the camera came up to the top, we just spread it out as the camera came up, and it made it look like the camera was uh, rotating. Wow. And attached the wildebeest to a point on that as we stretched them. Um, and it was very effective. And I thought... Oh, there made we, the sequence really dynamic. Yeah, and there we go. You know, we've we've got all the tools, and now we can use all the tools. We've got the CG computer, we've got CAPS, which 
is basically a 2D uh, uh, manipulating computer. And now we can, yeah, now I can use multiple levels without having to spend, you know, billions of dollars on the old uh, on the multiplane. multiplane camera. So uh, we worked on that, and um, one of my exciting times on there was when I was going to school, uh, Elton John, it was about 70s, you know, mid-70s, Elton John was a big... See him in concert. I couldn't get tickets. I couldn't see. I couldn't get tickets to save my life. Yeah. To see him. So one day I I come in on uh, Lion King to work, and it was early in the morning, and I hear piano playing. Uh, Sounds familiar, but who's here this early? And so I knew Rob Minkoff played piano. So I walked out, and there's Elton John. It's just Elton and me, and I'm standing there like. Where is it? Where is this? Where's the camera? The piano? Yeah, it was, was it on it a was, stage or was no? It was in the middle of the Hart Dannon building. Oh, okay. We had a, we had an open area, uh, like a, a meeting area, in the middle of the building, and there was a a grand piano there. And he just came through and started playing. He just started playing, and he said, "Hey, you want to hear something?" I, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And he played uh, "Circle of Life." I just wrote this, and you want to hear it? And, yeah, okay. So that was that was. So you were one of the first yeah. people that ever heard the cir- yeah. circle of life. Yeah, and uh, you know it sounded great. It sounded like an Elton John song, and that's when uh, 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 Hans Zimmer Hans came, came in, in and, and he put his touch to it. It was great, you know, and the story's written. Well, what happened was uh, I helped out uh, Dan St. Pierre. He was the layout supervisor on yeah. the movie, and uh, at one point. He needed some help, so I became the co-supervisor. Yeah. And uh, helped him uh, get the picture done. Yeah. And as we were going through, the people transitioned back onto uh, Pocahontas. And uh, I, towards the end, got to uh, be placed onto the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Terrific. And... uh, Because that's a very well-designed, art-directed film. Yeah, that was... Challenging. That was really challenging. But what was so great about that, once again, it's almost like every picture there was something new coming in, and they had just purchased the uh, Paris studio. Mm-hmm. It was actually purchased by TV, which came into uh, features. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the Paris studio got the first sequence to do. And in our inevitable way, since now we had the CAPS computer, the first shot of the picture where we go through the city, mm-hmm. they, you know, I, I was challenged by by Peter Schneider, who was president at the time of animation. He said, uh, you know, uh, well, what can we do here? And uh, Dan St. Pierre was uh, the liaison. He was the lead on those sequences over in Paris with the uh, Parisian animators that we had. Right. And uh, so we, we did... I think we had 200 pieces of artwork to get through that city. Yeah. And it was all 2D with the with the computer. And what happened was we jammed the computer. We actually broke the computer. But overloading be, it? Yeah, but but because of doing that, what happened was they came up with a uh, a program that would uh, it's almost like a depth map where mm-hmm. the computer because everything gets jammed into a like a postage stamp all the artwork when the camera's away from it you know as you were trucking into all this artwork Mm -hmm. um they came up with like a depth map thing so that the artwork doesn't turn on until the computer knows that it's going to be visible Mm -hmm. and they still use that to this day you know it was kind of one of those things that because we broke it they came up with a a way of saving uh budget uh, time for the computer Hmm. Uh, cost so that worked out and uh, the show was fairly uh, uh, liked but is you know it was a it was a pretty dark story oh yeah we had our gargoyles you know, to, to help uh, we had a lot of fun working through that and um, managed to get that done and I went to uh, we had a little break so I got to work on um, Mulan Oh yeah. After that, I went now to did Florida. you go to Florida? Went to Florida for a little bit, 
you know, it was only a couple of weeks, but I came back here and, and I workbooked a few sequences for them on that picture. And what do you remember from that picture? What was the most challenging thing about that? Because that's a new environment. The style. Done before. The style. The Chinese style. Yeah, which was great. It was. I love a challenge like that, and that was really one of the first times that I felt we were actually doing something totally different. Uh, you know, it was the Chinese style, and it fit the picture. The landscapes, the architecture. Yeah, yeah, and so that was that was a lot of fun. Um, the workbook phase was quite interesting. Layout at the time, uh, we had so much to do. Was, uh, you had your cinematography and you had your art, and there were few people who could do both. Yeah. And the workbooks really came about, uh, that was something that uh, we, uh, I think both Mike Peraza and I pulled back into the studio. We learned from Ken O'Connor. The workbook? Yeah. Explain the workbook, because you've got, you used to just have big traditional yeah. layouts, and yeah. our Workbooks are what? Thumbnails. It's just like storyboarding. They're, they're like thumbnailing. Yeah, it's storyboarding the cinematography. Sort of blocking it. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the 40s they used it uh, when what would happen was that they'd be working on a movie and the storyboard guys would be on a different movie. And so they had to, you know, uh, if there was a change in the in a sequence or a writing, somebody had to, to thumbnail it. And the thumbnails became storyboards, so they didn't want to call them storyboards, so they called them workbooking. Oh, okay. And uh, it was just, set, like I said, setting up camera, where a lot of times the storyboard guys really, storyboarding is about the acting. So you'll have a panel after a panel after panel instead of really having, say, like if you have a character that walks downstairs, you'd have four or five different panels. Where the workbook is, uh, you'd have the layout. And you have the character that we would take, literally, I, I told my, my crew to just pull right off the storyboard panels because they've seen it, it's on the story reel, and they're probably better drawings than we would do anyway as far as acting. And so we would take the character poses and put them in our layouts and actually draw the area where the camera would pass through. So you'd have a pan or a diagonal pan or a vertical pan in as one piece. You'd have a camera. So you move. would actually see it. Yeah. Visually. And that's what workbooking was. And what happened was uh, things started moving so fast. Back in the 80s, 90s, there wasn't time to go back into the storyboard guys. They were already, once again, onto another picture. Or moving had on. And so the next group of people down was layout. So you had your storyboard, then you had layout, and, and then you had you animation. Had, yeah. So before it got to animation, which is your, your final, you know, layout guys would come in and do uh, some workbooking and hmm. set up the shots. But it became, we, would, it, we started doing the entire storyboard as a workbook. So going through and changing the, the single panels into what would be like a cinematographer's book. And then became, uh, I think, overdone or abused because we started doing renderings on them, and really all they are are thumbnails right. just to get it through. It's so just they weird. were sort of over... Uh, what tends to happen, as far as I can see, is everything starts to be oversold. Animatics yeah. become very yeah. elaborate yeah. story reels, which isn't the purpose of an animatic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically a digital light reel. It's to get it reel. so that you can actually do it. Yeah. And it's very similar to what happens today, uh, trying to sell a new show or something where you have a storyboard and then they want you to paint it and they want it color and they want to see it all done before you're even doing it. They want to see it, it. <laughs> they want they to see see it see produced it before it's yeah. produced. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's always what it's, it struck me. Okay, so after that show, where does Ed Gertner go next? Well, that was quite interesting. Uh, we were supposed to do A Princess of Mars when Disney... Um, purchased Tarzan, they also purchased The Princess of Mars from oh, the Burroughs. Oh, this is a whole sort of John Carter thing. From the Burroughs uh, family. And so I thought, yeah, great. You know, I bought myself a first edition and read it, and I thought, oh, my God, we're doing a science fiction thing, and it's going to be so much fun. Which Disney has now done with uh, yeah. Andrew S. Yeah, Andrew Stanton is now doing it. But at the time... Uh, I had a few months vacation built up, so I took off, and I had a vacation. Came back, and I, uh, I saw Don Hahn, and he said, what do you think about doing Journey to the Center of the Earth? And I went, oh, 
<laughs> uh, I wanted to do space. Um, but uh, I said, yeah, sure, that could be fun, you know, let's do it. And uh, it was Atlantis. We started Atlantis. So it started as Journey to the Center of the Earth and it sort of turned into something else. Yes. Uh, and I think we kind of melted down on that picture. Um, it had it, it could have been stronger, had beautiful artwork. Uh, I know both Kirk and Gary worked very hard. We all worked hard, but it's like the wheels had come off the 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 machine over there at yeah. Features. Uh, yeah, one of the one, one of my favorite storyboard artists who's been at Disney and now is at DreamWorks. Won't mention his name. He said that they kept coming up to him saying, "What do you think of the picture?" And he kept telling him, "There's nothing there." And then they would get offended yeah. and go away. And he said, finally, they stopped talking to me. Well, it, I had my own troubles because I was layout supervisor again. And, and I was lucky enough to get onto the pictures in the development stage. So I was basically a viz dev artist right. that would help develop the show. And when it got into production, I already knew what was there. So I was layout supervisor, and, and I could push the stuff through. Uh I wanted to do widescreen. Right. You know, if we're talking action adventure, let's do action adventure. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And so there was a, a, a thought going around that they had to buy bigger screens and bigger monitors. And I said, why? We're just, you're, you cut, you know, your width is still 16 inches. You just bring it down so that the aspect ratio matches. And then you have longer scenes, which I would think the animators would have liked. Yeah. You know, because now you can act. You don't have to cut. You can have the character walk across, turn, and, and do some acting. So uh, Chris Jenkins and I, uh, Chris Jenkins was the artistic coordinator at the time. Yeah. And uh, we we cut some film together of uh, widescreen movies. We, we took some of uh, Sleeping Beauty, and we took uh, Raiders, and we took... Uh, um, Black Cauldron. <laughs> well, no, yeah, no. we stayed away from, but uh, for a good reason. Uh, 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 Lawrence of Arabia. Oh yeah. And and said, you know, this is what we could get, and there was a problem. There were problems all the way along, but it was it, there was a positive push. We all wanted it to work, uh, but at the same time, we were getting this mixed messages from management about cost. And um, we said we want to do action adventure, and they said great. I said, well, action adventure means White in a normal picture where you go back at the ranch and you cut, you got to show. That's the adventure part of filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to make it in the same box as X, Y, and Z. Okay. So I was like, okay, how do we do this? So, you know, we, we, we worked it out, and it worked, but I will, I, 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 you never say never. Where we did Beauty and the Beast in one year, I was on Atlantis for six years. Wow, that's a long time. And... Picture finally came out, though. Just, yeah, and, it, you know, we got it in under budget. And uh, from what I understand. Yeah, Okay. Um, and it made some money, but, you know, it could have been better. And it just, I think it, it, we got into this grandiose movie-making uh, era. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, uh, I had a little bit of time, what was it, say downtime, um, and I went and worked on um, some of the shorts. There was going to be Fantasia 3. And so we did, I worked on... Um, a little bit of one by one, uh, little match girl, Lorenzo, and I started to work on another show with uh, Mike Gabriel. Now, didn't little match girl end up in Fantasia too? No. Oh, oh it never. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 it was released with the feature or something, and Lorenzo was uh, nominated Joe Grant. for an Academy you know, Award. And I was working with Joe Grant and and Bernie Mattinson. Yeah. And. Uh, on some of their stuff, and I did a, a few drawings for what was Mr. Popper's Penguins at the time. That, that was one of the last things that Joe Grant had done. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had along the way they gave us classes in in um, in Maya and a few of the other programs, and I loved working on it. So because I love to sculpt, and that's really you know in in layout that's what you're doing. You're 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 creating this world. You want a 3D. You know what it, when you're drawing, what's behind that tree? What's what's behind that building or what's in the back room. Yeah, yeah. And um, so Maya allowed me to do that. And so I was working on it, and I, I did a, a design for uh, Glenn Keane for uh, Rapunzel before... Uh, and, and it's uh, earlier incarnation. Yes, uh, sorry, yeah, Rapunzel, or Tangled. Um, but alas, they didn't keep me. At the end of 2003, they let me go. Oh, so you you left Disney feature for the second time yeah. in uh, 2003. Now yeah. that that time you didn't quit. No, well, they that said uh, we're laying you off. Yes. And so I had to go out and find work, and it was tough because I was at Disney for most of my career, and I didn't really stay in touch with too many people. And you know, it was a world that you could just live in. Yeah. And it was very difficult. It was very difficult to find work. Um, luckily, I, I, I'll zip through it. I worked on um, Fat Albert movie, and then I went that to... That was over at Warner Brothers. At Warner Brothers. Uh, Curious George at Universal. Yeah, I remember that and period. Then, we ran across each other yeah. all the time. Uh, and then I went on to the Hellboy animation oh, sure, series, yeah. which was a lot of fun. Uh, I wish it had... Gone on. We had a lot more stories, and that well, was working with Tad Stone. Yeah, with Tad Stones, and what was really interesting about that is we had all the live action actors' voices in our in our shows, and mm -hmm. and Guillermo del Toro looked at the scripts, and Mike, uh, uh, oh man, he's going to kill me now, um, the artist who did created El Boy, Mike. Uh, Mike Gabriel? No, not Mike. Gabriel. Sorry, Mike. Anyway. Um, uh, it was, come in, to you was involved, yes. Uh, it's the sparks in the head. Um, and so after that, I they decided not to do the series, and I moved on to uh, my old friend. I called up uh, Mark Kirkland, and I worked with him on The Simpsons. You did a number of episodes over there. Yeah. Now, did you work on a feature? No. I helped Mark... Um, get through the series while they were doing the feature. Oh, I see, yeah, because everybody ran downstairs yeah. to work on the feature, yeah. so they needed it was about 40%. all hands on deck. Yeah, and mm. what was happening is that they had to hire like 40%, and a lot of the people that came in weren't up to speed on some of their uh, artistic abilities, so we gave some uh, uh, classes, and I put some little pamphlets together, and I thought, Hmm, I ought to write a book. <clears throat> so I put all those ideas together, and I ended up writing a book in the at the end of uh, 2009, 2010 area, and uh, Focal Press uh, was my publisher. It's doing really well. It's actually being uh, translated into Mandarin right now. And we will put China. a link up to that. Yeah. So. Um, and so I, I finished the uh, the Simpsons and went on to uh, uh, work on uh, Neighbors from Hell mm -hmm. with uh, Bento Box and Bob's Burgers, and now I'm back at Disney again. I'm designing a new series for the Disney Junior Channel. And you're, so you're over in the Yahoo building. I'm Yahooing it. Which floor? Are you on the fourth, fourth floor? Fourth, fourth floor. floor. Can you talk about that series, or it hasn't been announced? No. So, no. okay. <laughs> so you sort of come full circle. You're, yeah. You're back at Disney TVA for like the third time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in between there, I should say, I was at, at Disney too. They worked on Tinkerbell, on one of the Tinkerbell movies. And I you, also, pitched a, you pitched a show over yeah. there as well, didn't you? Yeah. There was a, a show that I had worked with my old friends Joe Hadar and, and Kirk Weiss, and we did a, it was t temporary titled The Ghost uh, Picture. Oh, yeah. Ghost Show. Everybody loved it, but somewhere down the line, it just didn't uh, it, fly. It, it got it died. It it died in, uh, in 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 the process of becoming. Yes. So my last question, since we have sort of 
come full circle. Yes. You uh, were at Disney, left Disney, back at Disney, different divisions of Disney. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my, I have two questions for you. Do you find it difficult because you're one of the few people in the business that regularly swings from features to television? There are some others that do it, yeah. but for the most part, people get slotted and they get typecast yes. uh, in TV or they get they get typecast in features. Yeah. And how do you manage to make the transition? How do you do it in your head? Um, I don't look at it as uh, they're two different things. If I'm working on a show or I'm designing something, it's specific to that style of that show. And uh, I'm going to make it as good as I can. I'm not going to turn my head down and go, well, I'll draw halfway. I'll just, you know, kind of push it out. It's all about making the best you can. And I think that worked because I, even even to this day, I'm always doing more than I, I probably should, but, um, you know, it's the idea of getting involved and getting yourself wrapped up into the idea or the show and trying it, to make it as, as good as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, uh, it is tough sometimes, you know, especially when you're working on a show that uh, uh, a studio or whoever is paying the bills wants it a certain way and you're kind of looking at it a different way, but it's a job. And you have to adapt and you to have the to ad- people you have are to putting adapt. up the money. Yeah. I mean, it's a job, and if you want to be in the business, then that's what you got to do. Mm-hmm. There'll be your good times and there'll be bad times, but... Uh, if that's what you want to do, then you, you know it and you got to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've worked on some great stuff. I've worked on some bad stuff in, in, at every place, uh, including Disney. Yeah. Well, it's you know when you have a long career, you're not going to work on yeah. nothing but gems yeah. the whole way yeah. along. You're going to no. work on stuff that you go, eh. Yeah. It's like, and well, it's just the it, way it an works. experience. Last question. Yes. Uh, the five pieces of animation that you either worked on or inspired you in the course of your career or before your career when you were just thinking about getting into the business? Uh, favorite? or Yeah, just your favorites. Um, I like working on Winnie the Pooh. That was... It was the first time I was allowed to... I felt totally be free and do what I knew, what I thought was right. Um... I really I liked working on the Mouse Detective. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, I liked Hellboy. Um, uh, picking and choosing, um, but I liked the features. I liked Beauty and the Beast. I saw something grow, and it it was the first time I felt like as a team everybody worked hard to get this thing through because we knew that it was going to end if we didn't. Right. And it was it was a a, a true team effort. Yeah, yeah, that's always exciting. Uh, and last one. One of the strangest ones would would have been Lion King, because as working on it, we were going, "Well, this is good, but okay, where's it going? Is anybody gonna buy it?" Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, Lion King. Uh, and when it came out and just blew everybody away, I was like, "Okay." Did, did it really, startle did we, you a little bit? Yeah, it was kind. Of, it was strange, you know, because it's not that we didn't think it was any good. It was just. Why did why was it so big? Yeah, you know it was it was one of those things. It got bigger than it probably should have been. Well, it's but in, it was right timing. It's one of those imponderables. Then it came yeah. out in 3D a few months ago, and uh, well, that's fine. Did, I shouldn't uh, say this, but 3D to me is a is a joke. Well, it, it's, moving it's a, it's view a master. Gag. It's a gag. And now they're going to do Beauty and the Beast in 3D. They've already oh. put it together in 3D. Yeah. It's all about the money. Remember, it's all about wish, the money. I wish somebody had said. And maybe they did. I didn't hear it. People didn't go to see it because it was 3D. They went to see Lion King because it was a Lion King. And they made $150 million or somewhere in that era. Boy, that $150 million on, on a movie that was, what, 20? 17 years, 17 years old. old. That's great. If you can do that, why not? Yeah. You know, it helps all of us. So. Well, if, if it helps the people in the business, I'm all for it. So. Got that right. Thank you, Mr. Gertner. I appreciate it.